Swami Kriyananda James Donald Walters was a direct disciple of the great Indian master Paramahansa Yogananda. For 65 years, he dedicated his life to spreading the teachings and the spirit of his great guru. Swamiji was born in Romania in 1926. His parents were American. His mother told him that throughout her pregnancy, she was filled inwardly with joy. Lord, she prayed repeatedly, this first child I give to thee. Romania was young Donald's home until the age of 13. At nine, he was sent away to school in French Switzerland for his health. There he lived and studied for one and a half years. Thus, before he reached adolescence, he became fluent in four languages, English, German, Romanian, and French. From 1937 to 1939, he attended school in England. His family went to America for the summer holidays in 1939. They had just begun their return to Europe when Hitler invaded Poland and World War II began. Thus, they remained in America, settling in the eastern part of the country in Scarsdale, New York. Donald, from the age of 13, attended a succession of schools in the east, Hackley in Terrytown, New York, Kent School in Kent, Connecticut, Scarsdale High School, Haverford College outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. This unusual variety of schooling with the diverse experiences it offered helped to prepare him for a life of reaching out to people of many cultures and countries with the message of his great guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. In September 1948, in New York City, the young truth seeker read Paramahansa Yogananda's great opus, Autobiography of a Yogi. He took almost the next bus across America, a journey of four days and four nights to Los Angeles, where the guru had his headquarters. The first words he addressed to the master were, I want to be your disciple. Thus began the thrilling odyssey of young Swamiji's life. He was accepted that very day. From then on, he lived in his guru's ashram on Mount Washington. Only a year later, his guru placed him in charge of the other monks. Swamiji was to be given many other responsibilities over the years. Yogananda made him a teacher and minister and had him initiate others on his behalf. Later, he became the director of center activities worldwide for his guru's organization, Self-Realization Fellowship, and organized many aspects of the organization's work. In time, he became the first vice president and member of the SRF board of directors. His guru told him, your work will be lecturing, editing, and writing. On a number of occasions, Yoganandaji said to him, you have a great work to do. And after Yogananda's passing, Rajasi Janakananda, his foremost disciple, told Swamiji, Master has a great work to do through you, then added, and he will give you the strength to do it. In 1958, Swamiji went to India, where he lived for the better part of four years, teaching and lecturing. He also became widely known for his singing of bhajans in Bengali and Hindi. In Northern India especially, he lectured to thousands. He met privately with the Prime Minister, Pandit Nehru, who thought so well of him that he endorsed Swamiji's plan to develop a 25-acre piece of land in the Green Belt area of New Delhi near Birla Mandir. Here, Nehru is viewing Swamiji's painting of the proposed project. 
Alas for Swamiji's plans to serve his guru in India, his activities drew disfavor from the leaders of Self-Realization Fellowship in America. His intense desire to make his Guruji known in India seemed to them too original and creative. Fearful lest his activities endanger their own ability to control the work, they ordered Swamiji to return from India in July of 1962. Upon his return, they expelled him from the organization. Swamiji settled thereafter in San Francisco, California, and lived there for several years. He was invited to teach at Dr. Haridas Chowdhury's Cultural Integration Fellowship. Swamiji's love for his guru, however, kept the needle of his mental compass ever pointing toward serving him. Eventually, through classes in yoga and meditation, he began to share Yogananda's teachings in many places in and around San Francisco. His dismissal from organizational involvement proved not the tragedy it had first seemed, but a release, for it made creative activity possible in accordance with the instructions the Master had given to him personally. Swamiji began writing books and composing songs, the lyrics and melodies of which expressed his guru's philosophy. He wrote in all 150 books, each of them an offering to help deepen people's love for God and for truth. In addition, he composed over 400 pieces of music. He would often say, if you want to know me, Listen to my music. Ever in Swamiji's mind was his guru's keen interest in world brotherhood communities, for which he had expressed his enthusiasm dramatically at a garden party in 1949. He started in talking powerfully about communities. And he said, youth must go north, south, east, west, everywhere to spread this ideal of cooperative communities, world brotherhood communities. And he said, I am sowing my thoughts in the ether and my words shall not die. In 1968, Swami Kriyananda founded the first Ananda community, fulfilling Yogananda's dream of World Brotherhood colonies. The first buildings were geodesic domes, a shape Swamiji chose for its expansive effect on one's consciousness. Through the determined and joyful efforts of Ananda members, the community began to take shape and to grow coming in time to comprise some 800 acres of land. Here, about 200 member disciples of his Guru Deva now live. A principle Swami established with which everyone came in time to agree was, people are more important than things. This means that people's spiritual well-being is more important than projects or anything else. Closely related is the second principle, where there is dharma, adherence to truth and right action, there is victory. When one makes righteous action his pole star, any resulting hardship will prove in time to be a blessing when embraced with courage, gratitude, non-attachment, and deep faith in God. A spirit of harmony and cooperation has been fundamental to Ananda's success. The love and compassion that came toward the end of his life was in some cases almost startling. There was one story of a young man, Swami had traveled and he had come to, uh, back to Gorgon in northern India and he was sore his body didn't easily take to travel. 
So this young man who did massages came to help him. And in the course of their conversation, Swami found out that not only did the young man not have a massage table, but he was really struggling for finances. And so Swami not only offered to, but ended up buying him a massage table. And the young man was extremely grateful. And it would be a beautiful story if that were all that it were. But as this young man, he was maybe early 20s, he had a wife and two children by that time. As he was leaving the little ashram where Swami was staying, he burst into tears and told one of the staff there, he said, I grew up as an orphan and there was a hole in my heart and what I always missed my entire life was the feeling of the love of a father and now I have found that. And I don't think Swami did that consciously because this boy was an orphan. I don't think he knew. It was just a constant outpouring of openness so that the divine could work through him and so that master could work through him. At present, there exist six Ananda communities. Five of them are in America, Ananda Village in Nevada City, California, and others in Sacramento and Palo Alto, California, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. A sixth community in Assisi, Italy, welcomes guests from throughout Europe, Russia, and farther afield. Swami Kriyananda was always an example of both discipleship and a life given to spirit. But honestly, toward the end of his life, he became, I would describe it as almost transparent. The part that was Kriyananda had gotten so thin that all it really shone through was the love, the compassion, the discipleship to Master, and especially the joy that he had worked on for an entire lifetime, and he modeled that for us. It was a beautiful thing to see. Ananda's spiritual family includes, in addition, tens of thousands of others all over the world who devotedly follow the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda as brought to us and inspired by Swami Kriyananda. In 2003, in his 78th year, Swami Kriyanandaji felt his guru's guidance to return to India and take up once again the work he'd had to abandon more than 40 years earlier. At present, there are dynamic Ananda centers in Delhi, Gorgon, Noida, Bangalore, Chennai, Mumbai, Pune, and Calcutta. Yogananda came to show the underlying unity between the teachings of Jesus and those of Krishna. And so Ananda is equally at home in the West and the East. And yet the devotees in India are showing a particular receptivity to these teachings. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the future for Ananda Sangha seems bright on the Indian subcontinent, land of great saints and masters, and the birthplace of the great guru of Ananda Sangha, Sri Paramahansa Yogananda. Watching Swamiji grow over the years, I first met him when he was in his early 40s, and then till he passed away in his late 80s. And it was such a beautiful thing because every step of the way, there was a radiant disciple a radiant soul in his early years, dynamic energy and willpower, able to change the world, to give a lecture as brilliant and as expansive as you could ever want to hear. And then his later, his middle years, when he was more writing and putting his thoughts into those great books that he wrote, The New Path and uh, the Commentaries on the Gita, and establishing works in 
Europe and in India, then it, but it was more uh, transforming from him being a teacher to just manifesting things globally. And then at the end of his life, it was like all that was left was the soul. He, lecturing was not easy for him, writing was not easy for him, traveling was not easy for him, singing, any of the things, eating, walking. But what was left was the pure essence of who he was. And through all the outward forms, that was the thread that really, I think, inspired me from the very beginning till the very end. And that was the thread of the soul longing for God with every ounce of its being. And finally, one could feel at a certain point the longing and the yearning had been reciprocated. And there was no more striving. There was only resting in the beauty, the peace, the bliss of God. And as he said once, I no longer know where Swami Kriyananda ends and Yogananda starts. It was just one, that bliss of spirit. And to watch that transformation was one of the greatest, was one of the greatest gifts of my life.